croeso'n senedd, um, mae'n frain cael bod fyny, dwi erioed i wedi bod fyny o'r blaen, felly um, hyfryd cael bod fyny hyn i wrando ar um, tri arwr i fi um, yn, yn trafod uh, cenedl y campau a uh, dyfodol Cymru. Uh, welcome to you all to the senedd. Um, it's, it's quite a privilege to be here. It's definitely my first time. It's Baroness Tammy Gray Thompson's first time as well, isn't it? Not, not your first time, your first time, first time, there we are. So, and we're, we've been made very welcome, haven't we? So, dear um, Yeah, we're here to talk about a sporting nation, something that's very passionate um, to us. Um, and I will be opening the floor to any questions later on, so feel free to jot them down um, throughout the session, and then um, I'll, I'll uh, ask you later on for questions. Um, I'd like to start by... Um, introducing um, the, the panel, obviously, and myself. So, um, as I don't really need to introduce them, do I? But I will. Anyway, I've got Baroness Tani Gray-Thompson, uh, five Paralympic Games, 11 gold medals, and breaking 35 world records. That is truly incredible. Absolutely amazing. Um, now a cross-bench cross bench member of the House of Lords, uh, working on areas of physical activity, sport, and disability rights. Um, also, as I said in Welsh, a, a hero of mine, as well as, as Professor Laura McAllister, a CBE, uh, Professor of Public Policy and the Governor of Wales at Cardiff University, a former Chair of Sport Wales, a current Director of Football Association of Wales Trust, Deputy Chair of UFA, a Women's Football Committee, and Member of UEFA a Women's Strategy Working Group, without forgetting a former Wales international uh, football player and captain of the 24 caps. And moving on to our last legend uh, on the panel, Colin Chavis, uh, Chavis sorry, a former Wales uh, National Rugby Union captain, British and Irish Lions player, um, back road forward flanker number eight. Um, and in 2007, does this still stand, um, you became a record try scorer for the number of um, tries for a yeah. forward? It was, uh, it was actually my last Welsh game. Um, I scored a try which broke the record as uh, international uh, try scoring forward. But uh, this dirty Kiwi <laughs> by, by the name of Richie McCaw. Oh, oh yes, uh, we know him. Well. He broke the record um, in his last game. Oh, in yeah. his last game. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, but it, I suppose it's just one of those things. Records are there to be broken. Yes. Uh, it means that you know, somebody somewhere is getting better, mm. things are getting improving. So, uh, and that's what we will be talking about basically during this next hour. Um, um, uh, my name's Lowie Morgan. Um, I'm, uh, I don't know what I am anymore. I, th I, th I think sport has, has uh, put me on this wonderful roller coaster of, of, um, of a journey and has um, introduced many um, different areas in my life. So um, I'm a sport broadcaster, I'm actually a, a, an ultra run and adventure, um, and um, I try to keep out of trouble as much as possible. <laughs> so, sport, what does sport mean to me anyway? Um, sport for me has, I was brought up in Gower um, in, in an adventure playground, I would say. Um, you know, I was brought up uh, with the family surfing and cycling and, and running and just horse riding and, and just, you know, being active, basically. We were even taught to, to play archery, not that I was very good at it, but we were always taught as children when it came to sport to just try your hand at everything and, and take a risk sometimes and, and sometimes you'll find something that you're actually quite good at. Um, it's also given me friendships, it's given me a chance to learn about the world and given me a, a career in it as well, so I'm very fortunate. And I'm, I'm I, I, you know, going to ask uh, you three the same question, basically, what is sport to you? But th th I do have a very, very important question to ask Colin, first of all. Who's going to win the World Cup? Um, well, tom tomorrow's game is obviously extremely important. We have to beat Australia to give ourselves the best chance of, uh, of winning the World Cup. Um, I think we'll get, to, we'll get to the final, and the final will probably be against New Zealand. Uh, they will choke. We will win. That's it. Love it. Brilliant. So, Colin, what, what is sport to you? What, what's been your motivation, your inspiration? What's, what's, you know, take us back to those early years, well, basically. I can't, I, when, when, I was a, when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in the Midlands in, in England, um, and... I grew up playing a lot of soccer, um, running cross country, um, all sorts of athletics, um, 
bit of boxing, kickboxing, played rugby, I just any sport, anything that I could do, be outside enjoying myself, not in the house watching those four awful TV channels. Um, so sport was just everything for me. Um, and I suppose now it's much easier for me to look back on it having had a career in sport, but I was, I was basically very, very fortunate that something that I, I absolutely loved um, I could do as a job, and I ended up doing that for 17 years and playing for Wales for 10 of those years. That um, I was very, very fortunate in that respect. Very, very fortunate. But for me, the, the main thing with what sport provided me with was um, with a bit of a sad, sad story, I'm sorry, but um, my mum had died when I was a teenager, so single mum, and now I'm all on my own, and I found a new family in rugby. And then when I was at university in London, I played for London Welsh, and I, although I'm an English lad, I found my new family at London Welsh, and it inspired me so much that I moved to Wales to play for Wales, because it just, the guys meant so much to me, um, and I've been here ever since, and I absolutely love my life here. And, and you were saying earlier, what I found fascinating, you, you never aimed to become a British and Irish lion. It, you never aimed to play for Wales. It was just something integral to you, something that you loved doing. Yeah, you kind of, um, it's, with, with different sports, like playing rugby, I've played, in, I've played in four games where people have broken their necks. You know, it's, it's quite a dangerous sport at times. Um, but you, don't, you, don't, you can't plan things too much. So if you plan on being a British and Irish lion in four years, um, it only takes one injury at the wrong time and you're out. If you plan on going to a World Cup, um, an injury or some younger players come through and you haven't got a chance. So the main thing that you, you th I thought about as I was just taking each game as it came. And I played for London Welsh and then I played for Swansea. And then from Swansea I played for Wales. And from Wales I played for the British and Irish Lions. And then still playing for Wales, I made it as the captain. Mm. And I just took, none of them were specific goals ahead of me. I just took each game, each season, and then just grew with it and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Were you the same, Tani, when you were growing up? Did you think, right, I'm going to go, you know, become the most successful, you know, paralyzed, uh, ath um, uh, athlete? No, uh, no. Um, so I got paralysed at six. I was born with spina bifida and could walk a little bit when I was young and then got paralysed. So my spine collapsed. So it's actually my vertebrae that severed my spinal cord. Um, and it happened over about a year and a half. Don't remember it no pain, didn't miss a day of school. It just slowly stopped being able to do stuff. And it was my parents. So my mum, um, just completely mad about Welsh rugby, um, completely and utterly biased. Um, you know, I just remember first game I ever watched at home, we had to wear a bobble hat and scarf and shout, I hate Batty at the TV. Didn't have any clue who Grand Batty was. Um, and then my dad was very, you know, both, both love sport. My dad was very, um, you know, kind of knew everything about it, was really balanced about sport. So the early years, it was about just being physically active. It was about, because back then, disabled children were locked away from society, weren't in mainstream school. Um, and for me, it was about just being fit and able to, to go to a mainstream school, to, there weren't any lifts anywhere, you know, to be able to get out of my chair and crawl up the stairs and drag my chair. And then I kind of went into sport. Um, but I was one of those kids that just loved everything. I, I was just really useless at every sport. Um, and wheelchair racing was one of the last things I tried and that was because I was playing basketball and got fouled off because I had a fight with someone on the court and it was my, one of my PE teachers said go and do wheelchair racing because you can't get close enough to anyone to hit them and I was like okay I'll try that and then I had about five years where I didn't do it you know I, I knew I was getting better but I wasn't you know I was like fourth or third or maybe second I didn't win a race for five years so for me it was really good that I was under the radar I sort of developed but it was, I loved it. And that was the most important thing, was just loving doing it and being able to measure myself against myself. And then when I kind of made a jump, I knew that was completely what I wanted to do. And so sort I've of been retired 13 years now. So physical activity has gone back to being something that's massively important in my life because, well, partly what sport's done to me, which is, you know, my shoulders aren't great, my neck's not great. And, but I wouldn't change any of that. But, but actually, it's back to being physically able to do the things I want to do. Mm. So, you know, sport was just a bit of like divergence for me, really. Yeah, I, I, I personally feel that sport has given me a lot more in life 
Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's taught me a lot about life, basically. The lessons I've learned through, through sport mm -hmm. has helped me through life, you know? W w would you agree on? Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, my, my story's similar to Colin and, and Tani's, really. You know, as a sports mad kid, you know, from a sporty family. But, but I think definitely, you know, when I look back at, um, you know, I've never worked professionally in sport, you know, because my football wasn't professional for girls and women and everything else I've done has been pretty much, you know, aside from my main academic work. But, but it, a lot of the motivation for it, I think, has been because I know very much exactly what sport has given me, you know, and it's been a much greater contribution to the person I am than anything else, you know, and I, I often say to groups of young girls, you know, that I learnt more in the sports field than I did in the classroom or the lecture theatre. And, you know, and there's loads of cliches about this, aren't there, you know, over you know, how it teaches you to um, have self-discipline and goals and all the rest of it. But, but it, it's really about values, I think, you know, not, not goals. It's about the values you have as a person that are developed in sport, you know, uh, empathy for people around you and an understanding of what, what it makes, uh, what makes other people tick and so on. Mm. So I think we kind of all, all of us who have been athletes owe sport a lot as mm. well. And in some senses, that's why it isn't that hard to get us to do things, you know, on a voluntary basis back in sport. I mean, some pe people say it is, but I, I don't think it is. I think most ex-athletes, if they're asked, will put something back into it because mm. we know what we've got out of it, really. And pride as well of, of representing your country, I'm sure, you know, wearing that, you know, dragging that vest, that shirt. Um, Colin? Well, well, I, you know, when it, when it came to... Uh, for me, I, you know, I was adopted in let's say. Um, so I'm an adopted Welshman, um, and I'm very proud of that. Um, but, the, you know, when, we, when, you, when you pull on a red jersey, for me, pulling on a red jersey, and I, the privilege of, you know, I was born in England, and, I, and I'm here now, and these guys were stood singing the anthem, interlocked, and this is my family. And when you're in what was called, and it's now the Principality Stadium, but the Millennium Stadium, you've got 74,000 people singing along with you. Um, it was just an incredible feeling of belonging and being part of something. And you, you've kind of woven your life into the fabric of the nation. And it just felt incredible. And it, you really did just think, well, I just thought, this is what I was born to do. And this is, uh, and I'm half decent at it as well. That, that, that helps a little bit. Um, but you know, the, the pride, um, the pride in the, what it's taken to get where you are, the pride in the, the fans and the support and how everybody is pulling in the same direction. It was, it was just phenomenal. I think something that has always struck me is that there's loads of people out there doing wonderful things for Wales, you know, in, here in this institution, you know, in, in the arts and culture and in the schools and everything. But, but sport is kind of, it's got a sort of really unique status, really, almost too grand for what it is in some respects, because, you know, it matters so much to the nation, you know, when we're, we're playing whether that's rugby football or any other sport for that matter and I think you absorb some of that as a sports person then you know you're conscious that there are people in every community across Wales that you're effectively representing when you put on the, the Welsh shirt you know and, and I know this this apparently is controversial but I, I've because I've said it in my Western Mail column but I don't think it's controversial I think you can only really have one national identity in sport you know and um, it's, you two, it's different for you two because you competed for GB um, and for Wales. Um, but, you know, for me in, in football particularly, you know, the, the history of football is that Wales is a nation you aspire to play for, you know, and, and so therefore for me, you know, the whole concept of Olympic football and Team GB is, is anathema because it runs counter to everything that we had as children growing up, you know, there, there's not a GB in football, you know, we're, a, we're an independent nation that competes on its own. And, and so apparently that's controversial, but I think if you ask most footballers, they'd say exactly the same thing, you know, well, that's how we, we were developed. One of, one of, obviously from, from growing up in England, and I didn't really think of sport on that scale, um, it wasn't until I, I lived in Wales and played for Wales, but I went back to England and I played for Newcastle Falcons for two years. And the one thing I found, when you say you can't, you know, the, the difference between playing for Wales and, and GB, or the British and Irish Lions, I found in Newcastle, they were Geordies more than they were Englishmen. And if you go to Cornwall, they're Cornish people more than they're Englishmen. Whereas, you know, in, in Wales, there was one true identity. So they'd, they'd be the, they'd be the Welsh speak, like with the Welsh team, for example, the Westies, you know, the, the, um, 
Slashy mob. <laughs> they'd all be on one table speaking Welsh. The Easties, the Newport and Cardiff mob, they, they wouldn't be speaking Welsh. And the Swansea Bridge and Neath, we'd just be the guys in between. Um, but there was, a, there was a massive identity as one nation. And what I found, so playing for Newcastle, Johnny Wilkinson, who's an amazing English rugby player, amazing English rugby player, he was in the team. Um, and it was quite weird being next to him because he'd not single-handedly won the 2003 World Cup, but he was a major player in that um, successful English team. That in Wales, you can still go to Tesco's and touch Sam Warburton, but in England, you can't touch their heroes. You can't go, you know, um, not that I'm sneaking up on people all the time, but the identity in Wales, in it, you know, Geraint Thomas, mm. you know, you can, you'll see him in Wales, you know, you'll see him. Um, there was an event at the stadium, and I bumped into him and had a chat. You know, it's, it's really weird how we've got, and, and quite, I think part of our success is down to this. Mm. We've got that intimacy between one another that, that, and an identity that not many countries have. Compete for Wales three times in my senior career at Commonwealth Games, and there's such a difference between being part of the Welsh team to being part of the British team. Yeah, I was going to ask. And, it, and it's really weird. So, you know, the, the British team is bigger, and, and you're kind of slightly separated by sports, which you still have a little bit in the Welsh team, but there's this kind of camaraderie because you might not know, you know, that young swimmer from Neath, but you probably know their brother, or you know somebody. Yes. You're connected yes. in a completely different way, and I'd say some of the proudest moments. Um, in my career would be for competing for Wales. So carrying the flag at the Commonwealth Games opening ceremony, and I get really much, and, and looking behind and seeing all these Welsh athletes behind um, was just unbelievable. And in um, 2006, I remember going to watch the men's boxing heavyweight finals, English lad against a Welsh lad, and there was, I think there were four Welsh girls from the team, and we did our best to outshout 3,000 Englishmen. You know, we did pretty well, actually. And, and there's, this, there's this bond you get, and it is so completely different. Um, being part, and, yeah, it's, it's really difficult to explain it, but I feel really privileged to get to have competed for Wales because it's so totally, and I don't admit this often, I've, I've worked for the English team for, for one of the Commonwealth Games. There wasn't a women's event, so the English team said, will you go and compete? And there's not quite the same pride in the tracksuit and everything that goes with it. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm competing for England. There is something really different about competing for Wales. And, and I think that's what, what you said about just knowing people. So if I had to pick one of the best moments in my life in sport, it wouldn't be me doing it. It was, um, this is really self-indulgent. 2005, I got asked to lead the rugby team out, Wales against England, um, you know, and Matt Tate's first game, Paul Love, where he got turned over. Um, and... You know, and all the, the stuff with that. And, and I remember I wasn't allowed that far out onto the pitch because apparently my wheels would dig up the pitch. And, um, you know, Gareth Thomas, so the, the Welsh team were behind. And he's like, what are you doing there? And I'm not, I'm not allowed that far back. And he brought the whole Welsh team forward and kind of gave me a hug and I cried a lot. And, but I don't think you'd get that with others. The, that camaraderie, that kind of spirit is, is amazing. And what it teaches you, yeah, it's the same. It's resilience, it's, it, it's friendship, it's discipline. And... It's, there's something, I, I wouldn't swap competing for Wales for absolutely anything in, in my career. They, they were the three of the biggest moments in, in my sporting career. Well, you've certainly, all three of you have certainly inspired, um, you, and, and you mentioned role models. You're certainly role models for, well, I, I wouldn't want to think how, the, of the number, um, thousands of, of, of children. What do you think, and what needs to be done to inspire the next generation of, of sporting not just stars, but also children who just want to do sport because they just enjoy it, basically. Well, I, I mean, I don't think it is about role models for the youngest children. That's just a, a, a bolt-on, really. You know, for me, it's about getting PE right in mm. schools and, yeah. and get, getting attitudes right mm. about how the youngest children are active. Um, and, you know, I think, actually, it goes... For me, it goes to preschool, really. You know, I've seen with, with my girls, you know, that... By the time they reach school, they're already almost socialised out of sport, unless you're coming from a sporty family, you know. Mm. And, and it's easy for people like you and me because we're encouraging our children to do things from the time they're toddlers. But, you know, for, for um, other families who don't, then you can see what happens with girls particularly, you know, but by the time they're in school. But, but notwithstanding that, I think from a point of view of getting children involved in 
anything, not just sport, but anything active, mm. um, we've got to get the, the physical education offer right. You know, it's got to be right at the heart of the curriculum, as Tani's report said. God knows how many years ago now. Yeah. And there were lots of, by the way, there were lots of very nice words after the report came out, but not so much action, you know. Mm -hmm. And obviously the proof of the pudding will be in what happens with the new curriculum now and how that, how, what outcomes that generates. But, but, you know, I think it's a really basic thing. If children are not physically active in the school, you're relying on them being physically active outside the school, and we know that isn't necessarily happening. If they're not physically active, they don't have skills to be able to look after their health and mm. their nutrition and their even their economic activity at a later stage so it's, it's really absolutely fundamental and i think you know if, if government isn't serious about this you know then then i don't know what it's going to be serious about quite frankly yeah we well i, I was um with somebody yesterday we were talking just before we came on uh, the statistics are quite astonishing aren't they for for the the drop off as well you know the the percentage of children taking part in sport, but also the drop-off later on in life as well. I mean, for girls, you know, we always used to assume it was age 13 there was a drop-out in sport, and actually it's it's eight. It's just they're forced to do sport for a bit longer in school, and, you know, that really upsets me that young women are kind of doing it and not enjoying it. But if you look at sort of year seven children, the five fittest in the class today, 30 years ago, would have been the five least fittest. We've got a generation of young people who are going to die before their parents because of inactivity. You know, we've got an ageing population. Women's pension ages are only going one way, and soon men's pension ages will be going up as well. So um, if, if we don't take physical activity seriously, we're storing up a, a lot of problems. And Laura's absolutely right. You know, it's getting it right in schools. Physical literacy. We don't teach trigonometry without teaching maths, but we teach sports before teaching the basic skills. And for the sporty ones, that's great, because you just get stuck in. But we just leave a whole, you know, group of, of young people to, to one side. And... And that's a, you know, it's a massive shame. And I, I guess, you know, I mean, the report, you know, we did um, goes back to I think 2013, and we're still talking about it. And it's not rocket science. We know that children who learn to throw and catch a ball learn to read and write. I mean, it's just stop messing about, really. You know, whatever government, just stop messing about. Because if we want a nation that competes on the world stage, not just in sport but economically, and who knows what the next five or ten years are going to bring you know, we, we need to just do something differently. And, and the academic grades come with physical activity. You know, it's not as if there's not millions of pages of data out there that shows it, but we just sort of get stuck in this sort of slightly weird circle of, oh yeah, we'll do something in a couple of years. And you know, yeah, the curriculum, new curriculum, we'll, you know, commit to it. You know, just, just wait, stop messing about. Uh, and whilst, I'll, sorry. Whilst, whilst, whilst I agree with you, yeah. <laughs> I agree with the, the, the idea, so I, I when I was at school, uh, the first, my junior school, it was all soccer, because I've been in the Midlands. It was my senior school mm. that played rugby. So that, that's how I managed to pick up a ball. But I also played soccer for the local village. Um, and that was just run by volunteers. Mm. Um, and I think it was because my mum put me and my brother outside in the garden with a football and just made us mm. stay outside kicking a ball around. And I, I agree that our schools have got a lot to offer and education's got a lot to offer. But also, there is a network out there, and for me, because I understand rugby very well, mm. there's a massive network of rugby clubs across Wales mm. for young boys and young girls to go and play. And they play tag rugby, so it's not all about smashing one another over. Um, we can change things a little bit in that, like in New Zealand, the kids play by weight rather than by age. Mm -hmm. And I think that would help considerably mm. when, it go, when it comes to contact. Yeah. But in that, almost in that monkey see, monkey do, if, if we take our kids outside in a pair of wellies and jump in the puddles with them, mm. if we go and do a park run for one kilometre with our kids, mm. if we take them to the rugby club or take them to the soccer club or take them to netball, baseball, what, just cricket, whatever it be, <coughs> cross country, cyclocross, there's all sorts mm. now that kids can do. Mm. But I think as parents, we should also take a little mm. bit of responsibility for getting our kids out, buy them some waterproofs and get them out there ourselves. Mm. Yeah, th that is true because I, you know, I, I being a working mother, you know, I often, you know, struggle with that, you know, guilt of, you know, trying to fit training in, trying to work mm -hmm. full time, and, 
and uh, I was just, uh, as many of us, I'm sure, have these feelings of trying to multitask. But, um, and uh, I was having this conversation with somebody, and, and she turned around to me and she said, no, no, if you look at the stats, if you're, you know, if you're, you're not being selfish in a way because you're, you're actually introducing your son to a healthy lifestyle mm. and seeing a, a you know a, a healthy um, mother, a happier mother maybe, um, you know that's gonna he's gonna inherit mm. that um, that uh, feeling. I don't know if you agree with that. Well, having seen I that. think some of the other data shows that women put themselves last mm. quite often, and and if you've had a not terribly positive experience of sport or physical activity and you drop out and you you know you think it's I mean, when I was in school, you had to do it in gym knickers and air tech stops. I mean, it's vile. Um, and it's only because I like sport that, you know, you kind of put up with it. But it's, it's that pattern of behaviour that, that's got to change. And if women are putting themselves last and are not being physically active and, you know, working and, and trying to find time to balance. I mean, you're, you're right in terms of there's so many clubs out there, but you've got to almost be in a position where you can do that. And I think, you know, we've been doing a lot of work um, through some holidays, you know, the cost of kids clubs in some holidays are really expensive mm -hmm. and then you know the children are on free school meals um, there's no more money in the summer for them to be active so actually they do stay at home because you know a lot of families can't afford 30 pounds a day or whatever it is to to do activity so there's this cycle that we've got to find some way of breaking it and, and again so sort of educationally those, those kids on free school meals if they've done nothing over the summer they lose 80 percent of the fitness then they go back in september three months behind where they left so there's this cycle. There's not. If there was an easy answer, we would have done it. There's not. But we've, we've got to find some way of breaking that cycle. But I mean, I think I partly agree with Colin. Not entirely, though, because I think the, the reason that schools are so significant is that you know all children go to school, and there's a big socio-economic dimension, you know, to clubs and travel to clubs and so on, and how much it costs for parents to pay. They've got to be very motivated, obviously, and unable, you know, and have a car, for example, especially in rural areas to you know, get children to, to things. But but schools don't, you know, we, at the moment we don't maximise the potential of schools. So, you know, elongating the school day so that there is um, there are activities after half past three is economically good sense, obviously, for working parents, you know, because otherwise we're always looking for clubs that, we, you know, we, we're able to pay for some of us, but a lot of parents are not. Um, and secondly, you know, it would allow children to be doing not just sport, but, you know, drama or... Art whatever you know in that period between half past three and six o'clock you know and, and that's ridiculous because it doesn't have to be teachers delivering that you know this could be governing bodies of sport it could be you know your local clubs you know, whatever it is you know um but we don't we don't seem to be able to join up mm. the most obvious things that would make um make this a much more mm. viable option mm. for, for everyone talking about joining up um we, we talk about grassroots sport and elite sport and you, you talk to uh, elite athletes and they say, well, I wouldn't have been an elite athlete um, if I hadn't had the support as a, as a child uh, on the grassroots level. And then, you, you know, the grassroots, you know, level, you know, athletes are saying, well, I've been inspired by watching Yogi Ray Thomas, by watching Tammy Gray Thompson, by watching Laura McAllister, by watching Colin Chavez play. Um, is, is, is the answer in joining those two together, or do they are they two separate things? Identity. Well, I'd say one thing about the governance of sport. First of all, it seems to me completely ludicrous. You know, at UK level, where you've got an organisation like UK Sport, which is flooded with money. In all fairness, you know, looking after Olympic and Paralympic sport, um, that really has no interest um, because its remit doesn't cover it. Um, with the stages below, um, by, through which athletes become elite athletes, it's different in Wales, obviously, because you know Sport Wales does have a responsibility for the grassroots and the interim and the elite. But you know, this is a continuum. You know, you don't just suddenly become an elite athlete, and and neither do you know when a child is. 10 whether they're going to be an elite athlete in some sports so connecting all of that is really fundamental but but i think the balance is wrong as well you know if we keep chasing medals at all costs which is what we're doing effectively at uk level um, and places in the medal table and don't put in in place you know proper coaching programs and facilities programs that give kids places to play then all we're doing is is postponing you know a major crisis in sport and you know, if, if I was in, still involved with UK sport, I'd be saying to them, you should be looking over your shoulder because, you know, governments won't forever be as enthused about medals as they currently are. That could change any moment, you know, in the politics of sport. 
So when, I, sorry. Uh, I spent two years writing a report for Department of Culture, Media and Sport that is also sitting on a shelf somewhere um, about duty of care in sport. And, um, you know, I, I mean, medals are lovely, don't get me, and, and they are important. They, for that moment in time, that there is an inspiration to them. And, you know, we saw it in athletics after 2012, both the Olympics and Paralympics. You know, my little athletics club, lots of people turned up in the weeks after saying, I want to be the next Jess Dennis and I want to be the next David Weir. And you realise it's actually quite hard and quite boring. And, you know, training at 8 o'clock on a Friday night when the wind's blowing and you've got to do six 200 metres is not fun for a lot of people. For some, you know, me it was, but for a lot of it's not. So we, we funnel our children through and we're asking younger and younger children to make really big decisions about whether they're going to commit to being an elite athlete. You know, in gymnastics, we're asking seven-year-olds to commit to 22 hours training a week. And I didn't have to make any big decisions in athletics until I was 18. Um, and actually, if I existed now in the sport as a youngster, I wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't have hit any of the key targets. I, I wouldn't have made that jump. And so I do worry that we're, we're kind of pushing youngsters through and we just discard them. We throw them out. So, you know, for Rio, um, there was a group of athletes that found out they hadn't made the team by Facebook because the performance director said, oh, I don't, I don't like telling people they're dropped. But I think, you know, and, and I, know, I know elite sport's hard, mm -hmm. but... But I think we haven't quite got that balance right in terms of... Because actually what you need, and I'm really harsh, but I, don't, I haven't got any issue sucking every last ounce of athletic talent out of an elite athlete before they retire. It's how we put them back together, and it's how we recycle those who drop out, because they can be coaches, volunteers. Yeah. They'll be... I meet... So, I've got, you know, a lot of friends, ex-athletes, elite athletes, who say they would never allow their child to do their sport. And that's really sad, actually. Really, really sad. That, you know, and it, we can't make it all lovely and cuddly. But I think we, we've shown we can win medals. We need to show we can do it with duty of care. I think... Who's well, going to disagree with me? So, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you. It's, it's very different, though, when, um, when you're with a team sport yeah. that, for a start, needs 15 people on the pitch. Yeah. And, you know, you need a squad of about 30 to create a season. You know, mm -hmm. so, yeah. so with rugby, you need a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like soccer, a couple of goalposts, and two or three of you can, can have a great time. Mm -hmm. You know, the... Athletics, swimmers, you know, they can do a lot on their own. Yeah. But what I try, so I was in Aberdeer Rugby Club on Wednesday night, and I, I was in Blackwood Rugby Club last night, and I had the same kind of message to get across to the guys there that it doesn't matter whether you're putting on your red jersey of Wales or your white jersey for Swansea or your, your black and amber for, for Newport, if you're putting on your jersey with your mates, it's the same emotions, it's the same feelings with the same team, with, you know, the aspects that's important. So when we talk about trying to bridge the gap, I find it quite important that Mumbles under 10s understand that it's about playing, camaraderie, being together for one another, discipline, being organised, training, listening to your coach, respecting the referee, having those kind of values, because that's exactly what the national team have. And I think what we need to work on is, having, is not having the drop-off when they become teenagers. Yeah. But, I think getting them all quite young, really enjoying themselves, mm. really enjoying themselves, and just enjoying being part of a team, having the nerves before the game, going to training, you know, that rainy winter's evening, you know, and, and having the attitude to say, I'm going to do this mm -hmm. for my mates, for my team, and, and getting on with it. And I think that if we, if we concentrate on things like that, and the enjoyment that you're getting out of your sport, we won't get such a drop off if mm. we can create the the events, the training sessions more entertaining, the games more meaningful, you know, yeah. really giving people an opportunity to share those emotions and bond together. Yeah. We'll get more kids playing. So the gap between thousands and thousands of 10 year olds we've got and elite level will be people who really enjoy their sport and carry on in later years. I just wonder in rugby whether you've got more opportunities once you fall out of the system to carry on playing because I think there's lots of Olympic, Paralympic sports that if you're on the squad, you get everything. And you get coaching and funding, you know, you might not get a lot of money, but you get your physio and you, you get all this stuff. And if you're off, you get nothing. So, you know, I, I see some sports where it's really, really hard to keep going. There's, there's, a, tough it, one, there's a tough one with rugby, and, and I, I, I would love to know the answer for this. Um, so you get the kids, let's, let's say, uh, mumbles under 15s, and a couple of them get pulled to the Ospreys Academy. And then that under 15s team have now lost a couple of their best players. Yeah. So it becomes less enjoyable for the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. And if the guys don't make it in the academy, they very rarely come back. Yeah. And it's like players that move up a league 
when they go through youth. They move to a, a, mm. a stronger team. If they don't quite make it, they don't come back after a year or two. So we have, diff we have those kind of difficulties. Mm. But if we, I can only mention this for, for rugby because we have got that, that beautiful rugby club. Mm. We have got that part of the community. We have got that hub to work from mm. that we can make an environment where kids <coughs> show ambition, they go up. If it works, amazing. Good luck to you. We're all right behind you. And if it doesn't work, you come back, settle back in with your old mates, mm. and we can move the club forward together. And I think that that, that would be an amazing... Someone knew the answer to solving that. Mm. Not just rugby, but I think a lot of sports could benefit. I had a recommendation on that in my report, which was, was the same thing, was about not pulling kids out of school and, and giving them somewhere to go back, because actually that's where I think we lose a lot. You know, you almost... You know, if I had a child who I thought was going to earn 300 grand a week playing football, I might not be so bothered about her A-levels. But, you know, and, and it's some of those things. But, but taking youngsters out of, of that setting, I think, causes um, lots of... You know, I, I just think it's really sad when, you know, you tell a 12-year-old they're washed up and they're hopeless and they're never going to make it. Mm. I, well, I... You know, I just think yeah. it's... Bit, but, you know, that's... One, I mean, one, sorry, 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 one of the things about, about that with, with the soccer... Thing. And, and soccer is, is so huge. It's an amazing yeah. sport. And it's so huge. What we've got in Wales, if you take, apart from Cardiff and Swansea, mm. most people playing soccer in Wales are Welsh people. Yeah. So if I support Llandudno, yeah. it's a load of pe Welsh people playing. In you, all around Europe with the soccer teams, the superstars mm. aren't in the French league, aren't French people. In the English league, aren't English people. And that's when I go back to earlier when I said, you can see Geraint Thomas, yeah. you can touch Sam Warburton, and you know what school he went to. Yeah. But I think a lot of the sporting heroes in Wales, um, although I wasn't born in Wales, I accept that, but they are, gen they are Welsh people, you can go and touch them, you can see them, you can meet them. And I think that's one of the things that we've really got going for us, yeah. is Future. our sports are dominated by our people. The, the, well, which brings me on to, you know, the, gosh, Wales has enjoyed sporting success over the last decade plus now. And, and I'm sure for a small country, we're really punching above our weight. I, 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 you know, we're doing really yeah. well. And um, we've also been on international on the international stage, you know, we've, we've had, you know, the Ashes here, we've had the Champions League here, we've had um, the first game, football game of, of Olympics um, was in, at the Millennium Stadium at the time. Does that create a sporting nation as well, bringing big events into our country and introducing what we have to the world? We had, the, uh, we had Around the World Yacht and, I, I, you know, I was working on that and, and the sailor was, sailors were absolutely amazed at, at what we had, you know, the natural um, 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 facilities we also had, you know. And, and as an ultra runner, a mountain runner, mm -hmm. I, you know, I've, I've ra raced with world-class athletes on the mountains in Wales and they just can't get over mm -hmm. the, what we have, you know, our green gym, our blue gym, but also we have these amazing stadiums. So uh, in, a long, <laughs> in a long question, um, what, you know, does that help to bring in, obviously, economy, brings in money, but does that help create a sporting nation? Well, I th yeah, I mean, I think it, de it definitely does, but, but my concern about it is that there, there isn't a kind of strategy that brings it all together, you know, it, it's quite piecemeal if you look at it, you know, we bid for, ma and, and there's a, to be fair, it's not entirely our fault, because you have to bid for major events through the, you know, global governing bodies often, there's a huge commercial and private sector dimension to all of that. Um, but there are other things that we could do more effectively. You know, we we need to be we need to invest more in sports diplomacy, um, mm -hmm. and in you know international influence. So, you know, e even in the work that I'm doing with UEFA now, you know, it's it's kind of incredible that, you know, we sit at, around the table with some of the big football nations, you know, like Germany and, and England and Italy, and we've got the same say, you know. Um, but yet there's no strategy for how we might manage this. You know, we, we need people from Wales on the governing bodies of sport, you know, the, the federations and the confederations, and we need them to be speaking up for Wales. You know, the UK has a strategy, mm -hmm. by the way, you know, through UK sport, but we don't really have an effective strategy in Wales. And then I think you'd start looking at how, what else you do with a major event. You know, how do you use that as a way of networking with the decision makers in, um, in a particular sport like cricket or rugby or you know even even ultra running and ultra um, triathlon and so on um, and so I think that's important I also think you know people have got to relax a bit about what our 
politicians do, you know, because if, you know, it's absolutely crazy to me that people criticise the sports minister, the first minister for going to a major event. Well, you know, what, what do you want them to do? You know, they're, they're, they're there to be championing us as a sporting nation. Um, so, it, so what if it cost them, you know, two grand to get there? That's, that's you know, this is small fry in mon monetary terms if we're going to generate greater investment. So let's get over all that nonsense, you know, and have a strategy that is joined up, that brings the WRU together with the FAW, with Glamorgan Cricket and Cricket Wales and with the Welsh Athletics and whatever it is, and get them all to, un you know, understand what are we trying to get out of these events, you know, because there's always a legacy. Mm. Um, it might not be exactly what you want, but, you know, you, there's always a legacy legacy but you know legacy fails because you're not ready for it you know you haven't prepared an infrastructure to benefit from that I think we need to make a bit more of a song and dance about what we have achieved and what we have got that I, I went on a, a, a mountain it's a bike. very Welsh thing isn't it you know really? we're, we're punch <laughs> we say we're punching well above our weight um, and probably one of the most motivating factors there is we're underdogs and you do you know the underdog, the plucky underdog, is always going to do their best, be the best they possibly, possibly can be on the day and want to make that upset, want to cause the upset. The plucky underdog, and that's what we are. But we, we have to remember we've got a good heritage as well. Boxing, cycling, we've got some of the world's best mountain biking facilities here. We've got all sorts. But we, we don't sit, make a song and dance about it. And I think that if we just publicised a little bit more about what we've actually achieved and who's here and what they've done, it could inspire a little bit more. So I'm all for being the plucky underdog, because going out as uh, you know, when you when you're the favourite is, is not good in a rugby match because everyone wants to knock you over. Mm. Um, but I think we could make a, a bit more of a song and dance about what we have got and what we have achieved, mm. because some of it is is just fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I, think we, I think international events, so Olympics and Paralympics are changing. You know, it's. It, it's getting more and more difficult to put on those really massive events. So, in fact, the IOC had to award Paris and LA at the same time because they were really worried because Paris, bless them, had tried and tried and tried and not got Olympics and Paralympics. And they were worried about them dropping out and, you know, some of the politics of that. So, you know, I would love to see a Commonwealth Games in Wales. Um, but you've got to just be really smart about um, how it's done and how it's built and what venues you need and the legacy. And, you know, I, I sat on the Olympic Park Legacy Board and... Um, you know, we, we sometimes think of legacy just in terms of participation numbers, and that is part of it. But the participation numbers weren't going to change unless there was a radical investment and a completely different thought behind changing what we do in schools and outside and how things are funded. But actually, as the park, you know, they, they did amazing things. So, you know, we can't fill a basketball arena, so they packed it up and sold it on. Um, and yes, it costs slightly more to buy. I think it was 83 million to buy it. And if there was a permanent venue, it would have been about 70, which is a lot of money. But you know, it was going to cost a loading legacy to run it and no one running it. So some of the stuff that's happened there, I think we can learn a lot and, you know, we've got experts going around the world telling other games how to do it. So I think the major games help, but you're right. We, you know, we don't think about soft power enough. We don't think about our influence around the world. And, and we should be smarter about that. And, and coming from UK sport, you know, they should be thinking about how they can be selling Wales as well because of the benefits that, that it brings. So I think it's, it, we're missing a trick, really, in terms of what happens and you know conversations I've had about Commonwealth Games is like oh, it's too expensive mm. yeah, it, doesn't well, it, it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be the match is we could have had the Commonwealth Games yeah. you know when Durban pulled out of um, uh, the 2026 games it was going to Birmingham and there's a reason why it's going to Birmingham because it suits the biggest part of the UK for it to be in England mm. but if our government had been a bit braver at that moment and had actually gone out and said no we'll do it in Wales they would have been drawing down on UK government funds, you know, because there's a blinking Barnet consequential of what's going on in, in Birmingham as well. Mm. But, you know, it requires ambition. You know, you, yeah. you need it, the, we needed the leadership of the Welsh government to say, do you know, we're going to do it and we're going to yeah. get the money from, from yeah. UK, because we could have done. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we go about, you know, influencing uh, per the perception of Wales, you know, and Welsh people outside of the country? How do we go about then and, and try get these people to invest in, in Wales as a sporting nation? Well, I think we're doing, we're doing some of that now, you mm. know. Um, and actually, I, so I don't disagree, but I, I do disagree a bit with Colin talking about the kind of plucky underdog thing, because 
Um, I think it's a mistake to always kind of portray us as punching above our weight, even though I've said that, I have to confess, in my time yeah. as chair of sport with, uh, you know, this punching above your weight, this kind of small, you know, small country thing. Because, you know, if you look at some of the other successful sporting countries, they're small too. New Zealand, you know, New yeah. Zealand is phenomenally powerful. You know, they don't talk about themselves as a small nation. They talk about themselves as a sporting nation. And, you know, we, we, we do achieve so much in, in, in Wales. And I think we've got to get out of that mentality of thinking of ourselves as, yeah. as smaller. Because commercially, there, are, there is probably a lot mm. more we could be doing. You know, the spin-offs from having some of the great events we've, we've done. Um, f for me, absolutely fundamental is a, a proper facility strategy for, for Wales. You know, because yeah. whilst we've got these wonderful stadia and, you know, the big mega stuff, the rest of the infrastructure of sport in Wales is crumbling, you know. I mean, you, you've only, you, you, anybody who's got kids who play football or rugby will know that, you know, kids can't play on the pitches we've got and we don't have enough, um, you know, quality artificial pitches, three or four G pitches. Same with, you know, running tracks, same with yeah. velodromes, same with, you know, gymnastics spaces, whatever it is. And I think until we're serious about a national facility strategy, mm -hmm. then I think we could get all the kids in the world in Wales interested and they won't be able to do anything anywhere because there won't be spaces for them to play. Mm. Uh, time, time is going, actually, but we, I will be opening uh, the floor for questions, as I said earlier. But uh, there's one, one uh, well, few bits that I, I would like to talk about. Um, I know um, Laura and myself and, uh, have been working um, together with, a, uh, with Sarah over there and a few of us from um, Sport Wales about women in sport as well and watch her go is, is something that we've, um, a movement that we've been working on, a campaign. Um, what needs to be done when, when it comes to encouraging women, getting more um, women involved in sport, getting uh, well, more coverage for sport? Some, something that was, okay, I'm, not, I'm on the board of Swansea Rugby Club and we were the first uh, premiership rugby team to introduce uh, a ladies team that was funded the same way as the men's. So, the medical facilities, the travel, the kits, everything was the same. Um, and I, I don't think, I just think we've just got to make it just equal. Yeah. You know, that, that they have every, the, the, the ladies team, the men's team, um, we also have a disability team that we've funded. Um, everyone has the same right to use St. Helens pitch and the same amount of time to train and use the facilities and the same amount of money for their medical care. And we just, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm a little bit <laughs> naive there. But as a, as a board, we just said, well, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets the same. Let's just do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, have you seen a difference then with, with attitudes as well um, and coverage? And well, for, for the ladies in the team, the, the, what they've said to, to the chairman and, and to the board is they can't, they can't believe that some, they feel like spoiled, you know, that someone's doing all this for them because they've never had that before. Um, and we think that you can obviously see that the way they play and they're, they're a pretty successful team, mm -hmm. that they actually enjoy feeling a part of the club now and they've got their jerseys up in the in the in the um uh, in the clubhouse now so there's, the, the girls jerseys international jerseys are, are up there alongside the men's and I, and I think that and again and I, i'll confess to being extremely naive but we just made a decision to make it equal and, and we, we went for it so uh, for me you know any olympic or paralympic sport that doesn't support women equitably i'd cut the funding because over the years, all of these governing bodies have been told, oh, if you don't do it, we'll cut your funding, we don't. And it never happens. And I do see inequality in, in certain sports in terms of how men and women are treated, how boys and girls are treated, boys get more opportunities. They're quite often put up for more interviews. And then, you know, you've actually got to get the sports channels thinking differently about what they cover and being smarter. Um, it's just quite interesting, if you look over the years, about the type of sponsorship women will be offered. It's much more around beauty products and things like that. So, you know, Vicky Pendleton, a cyclist, had a massive sponsorship contract leading into 2012 with Pantene shampoo. I mean, if I was offered the money she was, I'd have grown my hair. Um, <laughs> but, oh, do you know, I keep dropping this, sorry. Um, but what's interesting, I think, with something like Liverpool Football Club, you know, they're now advertising Nivea, aren't they? Which is like, wow. So instead of maybe it, sort of the women moving up, there's maybe some of the men, you know, it's, it's, I, I just find this really interesting, but the reality is, you know, women will, will have access to far less sponsorship than, um, you know, gold medal winning female Olympians will get far less than a man who comes 10th. Mm. And, you know, there was a report that came out after the 2012 Games for Olympians about the top 10 earners, and there were two women on the list, but that, that was slightly fudged, I'm, I'm absolutely, I'm, I know it was, because... 
you know, it, it's just that struggle. So it, it kind of ends up being lots and lots of different things if you don't see women competing. And um, it, it's, it's hard to have that aspiration. You look at what's happening in the US with, you know, the fight for the women's football yeah. and equitable funding. And, and the reality is, you know, the other stuff that's happened in the US is with women's gymnastics. Mm how hundreds of young women were abused and it was allowed to happen and people knew about it and they didn't stop it um, because, you know, my, my personal view is, it's, well, it's, it's the women in the team. Um, and, and so there's lots of things that we need to take a cold, hard look at, at where elite sport is and how that filters down to, to try and break some of that, that circle again in, in terms of sport. And, you know, Man City as a football club done amazing. I mean, they've done the same. They just said, right, we're going to, you know, support women's game I'm quite radical about this I'd say to the Premier League if you don't support the women's um, part of the um, your teams you don't get to play in the Premier League you know just do it you know don't don't mess around the edges but, but it still feels to me a bit like we're, we're kind of just tinker around the edges with some of these things as broadcasters is that down are we partly to fault for not giving enough platform for women's sport on you know airtime basically and then as a result you'll get more sponsorship blah 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 I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's complex, but it's simple, in my opinion. You know, and one was, you know, I, I hear what Colin's saying. And I think that's a great example in in Swansea. You know, they're few, they're few and far between, in all honesty. And I think yeah. we're kind of in this weird environment at the moment, where people are seeing more women's sport in uh, on television and and alluded to in the bulletins you know, on Radio Wales and Radio Cymru and and so on. And so, and then they see commentators and analysts who are female, including yourself. You know, covering covering sport and all of that is great but actually if you strip all of that away there are really big structural uh, inequalities between women and men's sport and the more I think about this the more I think it's down to power and control you know and this is why the kind of drive for greater diversity on boards is important yeah. you know it's not just to get a couple of women's faces around and make them look good it's because you know women have different experiences of sport um, as we've talked about today um, and, and if you've got governing bodies, which in Wales I, I think are still like you know 60% male run or 70% male run, um, then they won't be making the right decisions for girls and women in sport. You know, it's as fundamental as that for me. You know, it's about a control and a power issue because that's what happens in every other sector. Until you get women around the table, using their experience to influence policy and decision making, you'll always get great examples, but they'll be odd ones you know there'll be there'll be uneven ones there'll be one one in the north and one in the south and yeah. nothing in between mm. so i think we've just got to change that really it's about eight or nine years ago there was a governing body that came to see me it was really funny and they said um we've decided we're going to have a woman on the board and it literally this is how they were talking to me we've, we're gonna have a woman and you know would you consider applying for it and i was like well i don't you know i like the sport and i'm not sure and we had this conversation and it just it was so misogynistic and patronizing and then this person who sat opposite me said to me, but of course, you know, the woman that we point can only talk about women's issues. What, you mean the whole of the sport? And he's like, no, women's issues. So I go, what, what, what's women's issues? And he, he started being slightly patronised again, so excuse me. I said, well, I can talk about periods then. Fabulous. And this guy melted in front of me. And it was like, oh, anyway, I didn't get on. Um, uh, what a surprise. Um, but, but, you know, it's that thing. It, if we're being treated as tokenistic, um, and unfortunately, it comes back to kind of funding and support. Do you know what? We've been talking about governance and women on boards for years and years and years, as long as I remember. And again, some sports are doing it quite well. And I'm really tired of hearing, well, there aren't any good women. There's loads of good women. Have you ever thought they may just not want to work with you? Um, and that's usually a bit of a shock to some of the governing bodies. So, you know, it, it's, it, if, if they're going to want to attract young people and volunteers and, you know, if the sport's going to continue, they need to move with the times. And, you know, I, I think the UK Sport, Sport England Governance uh, Code has gone some way. But, you know, I don't want to be 90 before we get equitable number of women on boards and number of women in performance jobs and coaching and things like that. And, and some of it comes back to, you know, if a woman does get to be a performance director, they go, oh, it's a woman's been appointed. You know, well, great. But again, that's, it's the tone and the language that comes with that. Um, which I, I struggle a bit. I'm, I'm just getting a bit more radical as I get older. So. <laughs> I, I, just, I'm, I'm going off tangent a bit, but I do have a story. I was in, um, in an adventure race. It was um, a multi-adventure race where we had to climb mountains, run across mountains, sail, and, and, um, and uh, oh, I, won't, I won't go on with the list. Anyway, we were uh, five in a team, all female. 
So we started off in the boat and uh, just on the on the start line and as they go round and we had the um, organisers coming up. No female team had ever completed the race before. So they came up to us, came onto the boat. Oh, fabulous, absolutely fabulous to have a group of women on. Just do your best. We're just proud that you're here. Just do your best. <laughs> Uh, by the fourth day, we were um, in second, and uh, they said, well, you're quite serious about this race, are you? <laughs> we were like, yeah, we, you know, we're just five athletes, regardless of, of um, gender. Anyway, we went down and won the race, but, um, but and, and they didn't want to give us the overall uh, cup. They wanted to give us the women's cup trophy. for the women's trophy, <laughs> which was a naked yeah. woman, as you can imagine. Oh. But um, anyway, that's, that's another story. <laughs> Do you think as well, though, like we've mentioned about getting women onto boards, let's think about the ethnic diversity of our country as well. Yeah. So we, we, could, we, could be, we could be talking about these things for years and years and years and years to come, but obviously we need a succession plan. And for all we know, the people on the boards at the moment, the governing bodies at the moment, their succession plan, the people that are going to follow through, the next generation leading our country in sport could be very di mm. diverse, could be very open-minded. We just, I'm, I'm just hoping, again, I'm just naive, aren't I? I'm just naive. <laughs> no, no, no. And I'm just Optimistic. Hoping, I'm, I'm hoping that the next generation through will yeah. see that. Well, I was going to ask, and, and I, I do want to touch upon uh, Disability Wales as well, the growth yeah. there. What, what are your thoughts on, on that? Because that's developed o over the years. Oh, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, I, th I think what it proves is you need, you know, people out there doing it and doing sports development and, and showing the growth and you know the reality is that when we had a different school system where there were special schools it was easier to develop disability sport because you knew where the children were and mainstreaming which has been brilliant for education has actually made sport harder because you don't have um, the same number of, of young people sort of to compete with and participate with and you know I there's lots of sports I can integrate in and there's lots that I can't um, so I think what Wales has done has been just amazing just you know far ahead of, of lots of other things that I see in the rest of the world in terms of where and invest in the money and, and how they're developing young people and talent to either you know go onto a pathway or to just have fun and be active so um, and I've always said if if I hadn't if I'd lived in England or Scotland or Northern Ireland I wouldn't have made being an athlete being in Wales just gave me so much and and that's what you see I think we'll, we'll see more Welsh athletes competing you know in GB teams but the participation figures uh, you know, are, are just way ahead of anything I see anywhere else. Which, which I, I don't know if this is a hint. <laughs> yeah. But um, which brings me on to, to the last question, and I, I hope that we've got a few more extra minutes, basically, to ask questions. But where, where do you see Wales as a sporting nation um, in 20 years? Oh, we've, I, I, we, you've mentioned a few <laughs> things: Commonwealth Games. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I would love to see Commonwealth Games, but I'd love to see us um, just have more confidence in ourselves and, and just um, be out there and be proud of what we've done. Um, and I think, you know, there's numbers of participants. There's lots of ways you can measure success. Um, but, yeah, right, yeah. shut up, Tani. Um, so there's loads of ways to measure success. It doesn't just have to be medals. I think that is, is part of it. Um, but I, I'd love to see Wales leading the way in, in things like physical literacy, mm. uh, long-term participation, girls' participation. The advantage of being in a small country is that it, it's, it's easier to get closer to the individuals to make it happen to the governing bodies, to the clubs, and it's just having that will there to do it. I, I think Wales um, can do so much more than it's doing, and it needs to have that confidence to, to believe in itself. I, I think we'll, we'll still be successful, probably a little bit more. I think that you know, having people like Geraint, having Sam Warburton, um, having Gareth Bale, having those individuals and that's only, that's only covering a couple of sports that we are so successful in. And the fact that, the, the, as a small country, and it is quite intimate, that yes, maybe we need to change the, the, the language from plucky underdogs, but you know, I think that because our major um, sporting successes are all woven into the fabric of our communities, means we've still got the ability to inspire the next generation, rather than the best players in the the best sportsmen being foreigners, I think, because everything's so homegrown, we will always be an inspiration. Laura? Well, I agree with all of that. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's spot on, really. I think, you know, we could, we could do with having a few, um, you know, senior women in sports which have never had women in them, you know, football, rugby, obviously. What, you know, next president of the WRU, a female, maybe, you know, or uh, next chief exec of the 
FAW, mm. not because they're, you know, token roles, but because that would probably change the whole strategy of the, the sport. Yeah. Mm. Um, are, are we allowed? Can we carry on for another five? Can yes. we? No, yes. Um, so, sorry about that. It, um, the timer was The on. timer. Oh, <laughs> gosh. That is efficient, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, any questions from the floor, then? Oh, Karen. Thank you for such oh, a great oh, discussion. Oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> just, just when you were going to talk, <laughs> that's a light. sign from above. Yeah, thanks for such a great discussion. It was. Um, we're in a political arena. I've been thinking about leadership a lot with the current climate, and sport seems to throw up natural-born leaders. Think about Alan Wynne's impact tomorrow. will be great, I'm sure. You've all captained Wales, um, and I just wonder what that privilege is like, what your leadership styles were like, and what were your people management issues with particular characters in the squad? And I know Tani might have a Commonwealth Games story about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Um, it's one of the proudest moments of my life, absolutely terrifying. Um, I, I, I did several team talks when I was Welsh team captain doing um, the, the Rugby Sevens team talk before they played New Zealand. Oh my God, I, I nearly threw up before I did it. Because they sort of said to me the night before, can you just come and have a chat to the boys? And I'm like, ah, it's my and, and I remember saying something like, you know, I, I cut off my right arm to be where you are right now. Uh, anyway, they lost their first match against New Zealand. Um, so I don't think I did that good a team talk, but um, I just remember sitting, so obviously rugby is this huge thing in my life completely and utterly, and I remember just sitting in front of the, the Welsh team just going, oh my god, I can't believe I'm doing this. And um, James Hooker was apparently at the back peeling bits of um, uh, paper off his water bottle, and um, he got told off at the end, and apparently it's because I'd made him cry. Oh. And he's like, no, I didn't mean to do that, no, I was meant to be kind of buoying you up. Um, so, yeah, um, we, we had some really interesting experiences as part of the Commonwealth Games team, you know, because you've got some quite young athletes and some older athletes and trying to balance that, and you're there competing, and then you're trying to support other people. And, um, you know, we, we had a couple of issues with some of um, some of the younger women on the team, which was quite challenging. And Anne Ellis, who was our chef to mission, said to me, can you go and sort it? And, you know, you're sitting having this quite complicated conversation with a 15-year-old girl where I'm going, I just... You know way more about life than I do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it was quite, I, I guess for me, it'd be lovely to be team captain and not competing. That would, and trying to, you know, when people come back to the village when they'd had, you know, a not great day and you're trying to pick them up and they'd had a great day and you're trying to calm them down. And, and I remember, um, it was again in Australia and uh, Nicole Cook was competing on the last night of the games and pretty much everyone else had finished. And I spent the whole of the time walking around because people were just outside, you know, because it's nice and warm and, you know, you know, having coffee and maybe a little drink and stuff. And I just spent my whole time going, Nicole Cook's competing tomorrow, shh. Mm -hmm. And for probably like, you know, 10 years after, I'd get Welsh athletes coming up to me going, Nicole Cook's competing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. yeah. <sighs> so, I mean, yeah, it, it's, uh, so that's kind of funny if you're on a team, if you, if you know, it's not funny in the real world. But yeah, that, that sort of stuff, it, it was just amazing. And it's, it, you just feel this pressure on you. Um, which is great, but it's also quite scary. The odd, the odd one uh, for me about being captain with, with Wales was there's, there's one massive negative. Everybody asks you questions all the time. So you'd be, in the, you'd be away on tour. What time's breakfast? Breakfast, same time, yeah. same time as like yesterday, mate. <laughs> what, kit, what kit are we wearing? Yeah. Same kit as yesterday. <laughs> What we're doing at training, I don't know. I haven't asked the coach. <laughs> what time we go to, go to bed? When you want to go to bed, mate? You know, and <laughs> people were just constantly asking you questions, and, I, and that really, really got me down. Uh, so I used to ban people from asking me <laughs> questions, and that was the, probably the worst bit of it. But the, the the best bit of it was the bit in the changing rooms before oh. a few minutes before you go out and you and you sing your anthem, and you're the guy that says the last few words to the team, and a downside of that was sometimes I'd end up crying, and one of them, oh, he's gone again, he's gone again. <laughs> so someone would end, they'd all end up laughing at me. But, so that, but when, you, when you asked about leadership style, um, I remember uh, a, couple of, a couple of very good captains that I'd, I'd played rugby with over the years, and they didn't take themselves too seriously. You could see how much they were enjoying training, you could see how much they enjoyed playing, and their game was solid. They didn't have, you knew that they would perform, so that was one thing, you had to, as a captain, you had to know you could give your 80 minute shift. Um, and I remember um, when Martin Johnson captained the Lions in um, 2001, I remember thinking, looking at him as our captain, 
and thinking, if this was the First World War and we had to get out of the trenches and run for it, he'd be the one carrying the flag, not even allowed a gun. And I thought, that's, if I ever get to be captain, mm -hmm. I'm going to be like that. First one out of the trench, not even carrying a gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's about wanting to do the job as much as anything, you know, because, I mean, I, I, I always enjoyed being a captain more than I enjoyed not being a captain, and I think that says something about how you, you know, approach the role in, in, in itself, really. Um, and the other point, which is because Car Caroline alluded to it, you know, comparisons with where we are politically at the moment, you know, because I've just come off the back of doing a political programme about Brexit as well this morning. But, um, you know, it seems to me fairly obvious that if you're captain or prime minister, your job is not to behave like the rest of the population. It's actually to be the temperate one, you know, the one who's, who's creating some kind of calm and, some, and rising above the noise. Because whether that's in the dressing room or on the pitch, you know, when you, one of your teammates has lost her head or whatever it is, your job is not to just shout a bit louder than everybody else and throw in a few more abusive words, you know. Your, your job is actually to be the calm, collected one who can bring, bring things back down to uh, normal. And that's, I think that's, that's the problem we're facing in politics at the moment, is that the temperature's rising and all our senior politicians are also raising the temperature. If you did that in sport, I don't think you'd last five minutes, I, quite frankly. The, 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 uh, the, the story I was telling you about the Three Peaks Yacht Race, um, we, our skipper, you could hardly hear her, but she was one of the best captains I've ever had because it was about compassion, it was about composure, it was about encouragement. And, you know, she allowed us to share our thoughts, you know, we all, we all were captains of our own game in a way, bringing, we weren't five athletes, we, mm. she made us feel like one team mm. and I think as a result our self-worth and self-belief just spiralled because we had that mm. right, you know we were only sleeping 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off basically, that's all we were having every 24 hours and so we knew on this tiny ship we only had like a yacht more like it, you know sleep deprivation could just spark a, a, like a really angry um, response basically mm. um, but they understood it it was about understanding mm. people um, do we have uh, another question I, I am aware that we've gone over time so if anybody wants to leave you're welcome to um, but yeah just the one more <laughs> oh, oh there are some. two, oh, yeah. two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll go with you yeah, okay. um, yeah hi uh, I'm uh, my name is Rob Chapman um, one quick observation, one very, very quick uh, question. I think the point about a national facility strategy, I think, is really interesting uh, against the current backcloth where there's a national infrastructure commission in Wales, um, and you know there, there is um, also an ongoing focus on the national development framework. So I think, in terms of nurturing, encouraging, promoting physical literacy, that ought to be on the agenda. That's something I will raise I, again. I, I know you've raised it already. I think it's a, it's a very good point. Um, I guess my principal question is about your learning in sport, and um, and maybe you know the, the talk about. Um, um, you know, Wales punching above its weight in, in, in certain certain categories, um, but there is a diffidence in Wales, a, sh a shyness, uh, uh, if you like, and I and I wonder whether the scope to be for Wales to be more confident, uh, not in an arrogant way, but in a confident way, and I just wonder whether there's a parallel with p politics and governance in Wales, that maybe we need to be a bit more confident about ourselves and us as a nation. And I've come to that conclusion fairly recently. What do you think? I think the, I'm, I'm, I'm not a political monster at all in, in that respect, but the one, the one thing that I would say there is, when I, when I think about when I was playing for Wales and what we were doing, you know, we, at, the, at that point, Wales had, as adult rugby players had the smallest number of, the, of all the Six Nations registered adult players. Um, so we, we knew we were, we were challenged. You know, England funding for rugby is three times the size for their community rugby as, as Welsh funding. So we kind of knew we were you know, up against it. And you know, the, you know, the, the Premiership, you know, no Welsh region or club has ever won the European Cup. They've got tons of them. So you know, they were World Cup champions. You know, it, I could go on. Um, but what we did um, was we set a game plan, and more often than not, when you, when you mentioned, Caroline, you mentioned about the captain, 
captain gets you motivated a little bit, but once you're on the pitch, it's all about the game plan. It's all about sticking to what we've been told, with what we've practiced, what we believe in, and, and just the, the captain would just marshal it a little bit. And, and I think that when it comes to leadership, when it comes to politics, when it comes to anything like that, having a plan and sticking to it, there's a bit of flexibility in it, but having a plan and sticking to it is, is the main thing. But a lot of what's going on now, whether we want to talk about the House of Commons or whether we want to talk about uh, the infrastructure of Welsh sport, there's not a great plan. Nobody knows what they're doing. Well, I, I've said that point quite a few times, you know, about the confidence issue. And if we could bottle a little bit of the confidence that our sports people have and transport it into other sectors, we'd be doing quite well. I mean, I give you, and this sounds stark, but there's a party that's represented in this chamber that wants to abolish it. Um, and if, if it ever came to the point uh, that, you know, we, we were facing a referendum on abolishing uh, the National Assembly for Wales, then I think we should have a very clear tactic. We say, OK, if you want to abolish the National Assembly for Wales, let's abolish the national rugby team for Wales as well and see if you like that. Because, you know, these, these are really important things. We haven't got any confidence in our politics whatsoever. You know, we're quite happy to, you know, treat this place as if it's um, incidental. Uh, but, you know, you tried taking away the national rugby team or the national football team, for that matter, and people's opinions change. So, you know, let's connect all this up. You know, this is all part of being a nation. You can't have one bit of it without having mm -hmm. another bit of it. Good. Mm -hmm. um, did, did, Sarah, did you have a question or did some... Yeah. All you have to ask is, as we're in this chamber, if you could put one thing in the manifesto of the sport, what would you put in? That's a good one. I'd probably have physical literacy. Um, because it's about changing a generational pattern. So, yeah, I mean, if, if I had five things, it'd be different. But we, if we don't do something now, we're going to have a nation that's not fit and able to compete um, sporting-wise or economically, and we, we have to take it seriously. Um, and, you know, there's... A, Sorry, picking up something Connie said, you know, money matters and stuff like that, but we're, we're always making, it feels like we're always making short term decisions. You know, the stuff that we did on physical literacy, then there's a STEM review and there's something else and something else, and we just, like death by review, to be honest. Um, and um, we've got to do something that's practical. So beyond the manifesto, actually just, just get on and do it. I think if we're going to create a, a fitter generation, we're going to save money anyway. Yeah. Mm. With, with, by yeah. being healthier, you know, we're yeah. going to have longer lives, we're going to, you know, we'll have less disease, when, you know, hopefully. Well, you live longer, yeah. um, but you die quicker. Mm. So be really careful how you quote that, but, you know, because mm. it does sound a bit harsh, but you live better longer, mm. and then, you know, it, your end of life is very different, so, and it saves money. We know it saves money. NHS, you know, there are 20 diseases that are, are aided. If you have cancer and you're fitter and healthier going into it, you, you will come out of it for, you know, so it's all this stuff that we just, we keep batting it away. And, and the, tra the, the trouble with a, a parliamentary term is everyone, um, I see it in the Commons, you know, everyone's obsessed with whatever our parliamentary term is going to be for the next couple of months. And then they worry about the next one afterwards. So we've, we've got to just take a, a, a much longer term view of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with the, definitely agree, obviously, with the education one. But and the facilities one, which I think is critical. But the, the other one I'd add in would be about the workforce, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, I think we, we've got to find ways of incentivising people to, do, to help with sport, you know, whether that's volunteering or coaching or refereeing, you know. Hundreds of games are cancelled every weekend because we haven't got enough officials to run them, you know. So I think w we, we, it would be good if a future government could think about the ways in which we incentivise people to become involved mm -hmm. in the infrastructure of sport, whatever that is, you know, because we could have all the players in the world, but if there aren't people there to run yes. sport yeah. and coach sport, then, you know, we're not going to get very far. I know that with, with the Welsh Rugby Union, if... Um Let's take Mumbles Rugby Club, for example. The, the secretary of M Mumbles Rugby Club, who's a volunteer, on a Sunday counts how many kids attend, counts how many dads and mums are coaching, counts how many boys, girls, counts, everything's counted. And the funding they get from the Welsh Rugby Union is then relative. And I, and I think that when it comes to, we're talking about more participation and better facilities. And it, we, you've got two ways around, you build it and they will come. And that's not going to happen. People aren't going to just go and build all these facilities and give you the stuff. But if we could evidence 
actually, because of volunteers, because of mum and dad, because of certain individuals at the school putting in that extra time, it's actually, it, it, we are moving in the right direction. We need a fund then to say, that's great, let's, now we can start building new facilities and now we can start developing. Otherwise, we'll be here in, the, in 20 years' time with the same Absolutely. question. I'm going to finish it there. I, I, I generally mean this. I could sit here for another hour. <laughs> 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 but thank you ever so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.